50,000 years ago, humans weren't a single species. We were just one branch on a crowded evolutionary tree. Neanderthals roamed icy Europe, stocky and strong, with brains as big as ours. Denisovans thrived in the highlands of Central Asia, leaving behind traces in our DNA, but almost nothing in the ground. On isolated islands, strange little humans, Homo floresiensis and Homo luzonensis, carved out lives in caves, unaware that a new kind of human was spreading across the globe. That human was us, Homo sapiens. But then something happened. One by one, the others vanished. Not overnight, not in a single war or disaster, but slowly, quietly, over thousands of years. And today, we're alone. The last and only human species left standing. Why? Was it evolution? Climate? Warfare? Interbreeding? Was there something inside us, some advantage, that doomed them and saved us? The truth isn't simple, but it is shocking. Welcome to Stone and Bone, where we uncover the lost truths of prehistoric humanity. Today, we're digging deep into one of the greatest mysteries of our species. Why did every other human vanish? And why are we still here? The world 50,000 years ago was not dominated by Homo sapiens. It was a shared world, wild, unforgiving, and full of human species that no longer exist. In the cold forests of Europe, Neanderthals hunted massive beasts with remarkable skill. Their tools were efficient, their bodies built for strength, and their societies complex enough to bury their dead and possibly care for the sick. For hundreds of thousands of years, they thrived without competition. To the east, in the shadows of Siberian mountains and the Tibetan plateau, lived the Denisovans, a mysterious people we know more from genetic traces than fossil bones. They left behind almost no tools, no art, and only a few bones in a Siberian cave. But their DNA survives in millions of people today, especially among indigenous populations in Oceania and Southeast Asia. Meanwhile, in Indonesia and the Philippines, two isolated species clung to survival on island chains. Homo floresiensis, the so-called hobbit, stood barely over three feet tall. They had small brains but used tools and fire. Nearby, Homo luzonensis carved out a parallel existence, likely from even older ancestors. And finally, rising from the African plains came Homo sapiens, our direct ancestors. They began pushing outward, first through the Middle East, then into Europe, Asia, and eventually the entire globe. For a brief moment in history, the Earth was home to at least five types of humans. But within just a few thousand years of Homo sapiens expansion, the rest began to disappear. Coincidence or consequence? Understanding that moment, when the world went from many humans to one, is key to understanding us. As Homo sapiens spread across the globe, the planet itself was shifting beneath everyone's feet. The world 50,000 years ago was entering the most intense phase of the last ice age. Glaciers thickened, sea levels dropped, forests retreated, rainfall patterns changed. The environment became unstable, colder, and in many regions, unforgiving. For Neanderthals, this was a deadly squeeze. They were built for the cold, short limbs, thick bones, heavy muscle, but their survival strategy relied on consistency. They hunted large mammals like reindeer and mammoths, often up close and at great personal risk. Their toolkits, while effective, changed little over tens of thousands of years. When those big animals became scarce or migrated beyond reach, Neanderthals struggled to adapt. Homo sapiens, on the other hand, showed signs of remarkable flexibility. Instead of focusing on just one food source, we gathered berries, hunted small game, fished, even scavenged when necessary. Our tools varied by region, composite spears, throwing sticks, even primitive fishing gear. In some groups, bone needles were used to stitch warm clothing from animal hides, something we've never confirmed Neanderthals could do. And we moved, often and far. Where others were tied to familiar territories, Homo sapiens adapted to new climates, new animals, and new plants. Mobility was our strategy, not just for survival, but for expansion. Even our social structures gave us an edge. Larger groups meant more shared knowledge, more diverse skills, and greater safety. In comparison, Neanderthal bands were smaller and more isolated, making it harder to pass on innovations or respond to rapid change. It wasn't that Neanderthals were unintelligent. 
They were capable, strong, and had their own survival strategies. But when the climate shifted, Homo sapiens adapted faster. And in a changing world, adaptability is the line between life and extinction. So, what truly separated us from the other humans? Not strength. Neanderthals were stronger, not brain size. Theirs were just as large, sometimes larger. It was something harder to see, but far more powerful. The way we thought. Homo sapiens developed a kind of communication that went beyond basic needs. Our ancestors didn't just point and grunt. They told stories. They passed on ideas. They imagined things that didn't exist. This wasn't just language. It was culture. In Africa and Europe, we find early evidence of symbolic behavior. Carved bones, beads made from snail shells, pigments for painting. In the caves of Chauvet and Lascaux, reindeer and lions leap across stone walls, animals brought to life with firelight and ochre. Some of these paintings are over 30,000 years old. That's not survival, that's art. Neanderthals may have had symbolic thought too. Some sites suggest they buried their dead, maybe even decorated caves, but the evidence is sparse, scattered, and less consistent. What this suggests is that Homo sapiens lived in shared mental worlds, full of symbols, rituals, and meaning. This mental software allowed us to cooperate at an entirely different level. We could teach a child not just how to hunt, but why the hunt mattered, when the herds would return, and how the spirits of the animals lived on. We could gather in large groups under common beliefs, trusting strangers who shared the same customs or tokens. That scale of trust, beyond bloodlines, was unprecedented. And that meant coordination, strategy, planning across seasons and even generations. Language and imagination weren't luxuries, they were survival tools. Tools that let us navigate not just the physical world, but the social and symbolic one. Where Neanderthals saw the forest, we saw a story. Where they saw a predator, we saw a myth. And in a dangerous, ever-changing world, it was storytelling, not strength, that helped our kind endure. For decades, the extinction of other human species was painted as a clean, simple narrative. Homo sapiens emerged, spread across the world, and outcompeted everyone else. The Neanderthals, Denisovans, and other archaic humans just couldn't keep up. But that version was missing something, our own DNA. In 2010, a groundbreaking genetic study revealed something astonishing. People of European and Asian descent carry up to 2% Neanderthal DNA in their genomes, and certain populations in Southeast Asia and Oceania, they carry even more, up to 5% Denisovan DNA. That changes everything. It means we didn't just encounter these other humans, we interbred with them. We didn't simply wipe them out through violence or outcompete them into extinction. We merged with them, however briefly, however unevenly. Imagine two groups meeting in a valley, one Neanderthal, one Sapiens. Maybe they fought, maybe they traded, maybe they formed uneasy alliances, but inevitably there were relationships, shared camps, children, and those children were hybrids, part Neanderthal, part Sapiens, genetically unique, biologically viable. But culturally, that's where the divide mattered. Most likely, these hybrid children grew up in Homo sapiens social groups. That means they learned our language, used our tools, followed our customs. Generation by generation, the physical differences blurred, the DNA survived, but the identity, the culture, was overwritten. This is called genetic absorption, and it's one of the most powerful forces in human history. When a smaller population mixes into a larger one, it disappears not by dying off, but by being blended in. Of course, not all interactions were peaceful. Some researchers believe competition for food or land may have led to skirmishes. Others point to the introduction of new pathogens. Homo sapiens, arriving from distant environments, may have carried viruses or bacteria that Neanderthals and Denisovans had never encountered, diseases that could sweep through isolated communities with devastating results. It's also worth noting that the Denisovans remain an enigma. We only know them from a few bones and teeth. Yet, their genes are found thousands of miles apart, in Tibetans, Papuans, and Australian Aboriginal populations. How? The answer likely lies in migration, contact, and complex relationships that we've barely begun to understand. So no, 
the story of their disappearance isn't one of simple conquest. The Neanderthals and Denisovans didn't just vanish into the cold, they live on inside us, in our immune systems, our metabolism, even how we respond to high altitudes. You carry the shadows of other humans in your blood. They didn't disappear, they became part of us. By the time Homo sapiens had spread across Europe and Asia, a quiet erasure had already begun. The Neanderthals, who had ruled Europe for over 300,000 years, were now disappearing. Not in a single catastrophic moment, not in one great battle, but piece by piece, group by group. Archaeological sites show their tools vanishing from the layers of soil, their campfires going cold. The last known Neanderthal populations clung to existence in isolated regions like Gibraltar, surviving as long as they could, cut off, is so dwindling, forgotten. In Siberia, the Denisovans left even fewer clues. We've never found a complete Denisovan skeleton, just fragments, a tooth here, a finger bone there. But their DNA suggests they were once widespread, from the Altai Mountains to the jungles of Southeast Asia. So, what happened? Like the Neanderthals, they may have been overwhelmed, not necessarily through violence, but through sheer numbers, disease exposure, and cultural absorption. And on the islands of Southeast Asia, the fates of Homo floresiensis and Homo luzonensis remain mysterious. Their isolated locations might have protected them from early contact, but they may have also doomed them. Rising sea levels could have swallowed their food sources. Volcanic activity might have disrupted ecosystems or perhaps the eventual arrival of Homo sapiens with fire, weapons, and a highly cooperative society simply outcompeted them in their own fragile environments. But here's what's striking. There's no archeological evidence of genocide, no scorched earth campaigns or mass graves. The extinction of other humans wasn't a war. It was a slow fade out, like smoke dissipating into the wind. Why? Because Homo sapiens weren't necessarily more intelligent, but we were more connected. We shared ideas, innovated together, and passed knowledge between groups. We formed complex alliances that allowed us to survive droughts, famines, and changing climates. We built social networks before we built cities. And in those networks, we shared tools, stories, and survival strategies. In the end, the world didn't kill the other humans. The world changed. And Homo sapiens, adaptive, flexible, and bonded by shared belief, moved with it. So, the last Neanderthal didn't fall in battle. He may have died of hunger, or cold, or simply old age with no one left to bury him. The Denisovans may have gone not with a scream, but with silence. And in their absence, we became what we are now, the sole survivors of a once diverse human world. But their story didn't end, because in every one of us, a fragment of them still speaks. We often tell ourselves we were destined to survive, that Homo sapiens were somehow superior, more intelligent, more evolved. But the truth is more complicated and far more human. We weren't the strongest. We weren't the fastest. We weren't even the only ones who could think, feel, or care. But we were the ones who connected, through language, through memory, through shared beliefs. We adapted to environments, yes, but we also adapted to each other. Our ancestors didn't just survive by hunting or hiding. They survived by belonging to groups, to stories, to cultures. They wove meaning into the world and passed that meaning down. And that's what made us human. The others, Neanderthals, Denisovans, Floresiensis, Luzonensis, they didn't all vanish in violence or despair. Some became part of us. Others simply faded when they could no longer hold on. But they were real. They were human. And their loss is a chapter in our story not a footnote. So, the next time you look in the mirror, remember, your face is built from survival, from memory, and from many lost voices. You're not just Homo sapiens, you're the last echo of a forgotten world.